there was a song I listened to as a kid called Judas Kiss by Petra. And uh, you guys ever heard of, heard of Petra? One of those legendary rock, Christian rock bands. And uh, I googled the lyrics just a minute ago. I was going to read that to you. And l- let me tell you something. Google is not reliable. They said... <laughs> They said that song was written... Now, I want to see who the saved guys in are today. It says, the songwriters, James Hetfield, Kirk Hammett, Lars Ulrich, and Robert Torejo. That's Metallica. <laughs> the lyrics, they say, I wonder how it makes you feel when the prodigal won't come home. I wonder how it makes you feel when he'd rather be on his own. I wonder what it's like for you when a lamb has gone astray. I wonder what it's like for you when your children disobey. It must be like another thorn stuck in your brow. It must be like another close friend's broken vow. It must be another nail right through your wrist. It must be just like Judas' kiss. I wonder how it makes you feel when no one seeks your face. I wonder how it makes you feel when they give up in the race. I wonder how what it's like for you when they willingly disobey. I wonder what it's like for you when they willingly walk away. It must be just like Judas' kiss. Last week we started this series and the title of the series is Judas' kiss. The subtitle was Who Was Judas? We always hear about Judas Nobody ever really preaches on Judas. They just kind of gloss over it like Judas is just another, he's just a greedy, petty thief. Yeah, he probably was, but there's a lot more to it. We talked about how we often look at stories and we, 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 we want to simplify even the most complicated stories. We want to relate with the hero most of the time, not the villain. We don't want to look at why they've become what they become. Look at the story arc. That's why deep and complicated movies aren't successful. It's why we just gloss it over. I mean, the only person I know that loves the villain as much as Dave loves Darth Vader, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, the guy just relates to the villain of that story. And we talked about who Judas was and why he betrayed Jesus. But we, we, we tend to simplify deep and complex stories. We, we always see ourselves as a, as a hero. And it's either black or white, good or evil. The, white, the, the good guy rides the white horse. The bad guy wears the black hat. And the simplified version of the account of Judas is he betrayed Jesus for just 30 pieces of silver. But it's much deeper. It's much more complex. It relates to us much more than we've ever thought about, than we've ever been taught. We talked about how Judas, theologians and historians uh, say that Judas was probably a member uh, of a group uh, of revolutionaries called the Sicarii. And they were known as the Dagger Men. And they were... uh, whipped into frenzies over the Roman occupation and they would carry daggers in their cloaks and they would wait till uh, there were lots of people around and they would pull out the dagger, they would murder any of the, uh, all, you know, uh, high pri- they murdered a high priest, they uh, would murder uh, Roman soldiers, just sneak up behind them and slit their throats, hide the dagger back in there. They would kill collaborators with the Romans and then they would just blend back into the crowd. And some theologians say that Judas was a part of that that movement, that he was a violent revolutionary, that he was hoping for a a violent uh, revolution to just take over and 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 kill that that Roman uh, those Roman occupiers. And some theologians will say that Judas was more than a thief. That. He was manipulating Jesus Christ to become that violent revolutionary that they so desired. And we talked about how Judas really believed that he could manipulate Jesus and bend him to his will 
instead of Judas bending to the Messiah's will. Because they've always been taught and they'd always been taught that the Messiah was going to come, he was going to start a revolution, he was going to overthrow the Romans, and then we would have the kingdom of God through violent revolution. And we summed it up last week with this. Why did Judas betray Jesus? And it was because he could not trust. He could not trust. Go ahead and open up your Bibles this morning and stand with me. We're going to go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. Are you thankful for the Word of God this morning? Are you thankful for His presence that we felt today? Are, are you thankful for what He's going to do this morning? What He's going to do this week? The healing, the deliverance that's going to happen? Got great testimony of things that went on last week and things that happened. God moving and touching hearts in this, in this place. And that's what we want to see. That's what we want to see. I'm convinced that eventually the church is going to, and I've said it before and I'll say it again until I'm blue in the face, we're going to start living like he's already been here instead of acting like he's coming back one day. My hope is not in a far off kingdom. My hope is in the kingdom of God, a kingdom that Jesus Christ established when he stepped his foot on this earth. And let me reassure you something, that you are children of God. That where you walk is holy ground. Where you stand is holy ground. He's not in a temple anymore. We are the temple of God. The Holy Spirit lives in us and moves through us. We don't have to travel overseas to go to a holy land. When you walk in your front door, you are in holy land. Set apart, sanctified. You are the temple, church. What you speak in accordance to God's will will come to pass. According to his will. Pastor says, read the word and stop, Jason. We're all standing for this moment. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we can share in your word this morning. We thank you for your presence. We know that you are going to speak to our hearts. Lord, don't let me say anything that is out of bounds or outside of your will or contrary to any scripture. We just ask that you would just open our ears and more importantly, open our hearts to what you would have for us this morning. Not so we can hoard it up. Not so we can keep it to ourselves, but so we can go out and share the kingdom of God. The very living word of God. God that reigns, God that lives, a God that died and rose. Yes. Oh, we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. Amen. Jesus took the bread. And you can be seated. He blessed it. And then he broke the bread. I had a great big piece of sourdough bread I was going to bring this morning so I could break it and it would be all dramatic and somebody ate it. (laughs) But he broke it, which is what we're called to do. Breaking is essential if we're to participate in Jesus with bringing salvation and healing to this world. It's much easier for me to reach those that are lost and undone without Jesus Christ if I'm able to speak a word to them and say, be healed. Let your mind be clear. Let your body work as it's supposed to. Our bodies are to serve us so we can serve Him. He's the author of it. He created it. If He did, He can heal it. And he will heal it. He delivers us from addiction. He comforts us in our pain. This is the cross. This is the cross. This is what we need more of. 
We need to be the ones that are anointing the body of Christ with the perfume, with the oil. Let it be preached anywhere the gospel is shared. That we are lifting up Jesus Christ. He is the anointed one. He is the oil pressed in the garden. We talked about being squeezed last week. What, what happens when you squeeze something? What's inside comes out. That happens under pressure. Breaking is essential. Anybody in here ever been under pressure? <laughs> Yum, dum, dum, da, 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 dum, dum, da, da, da. I've been under pressure. We've all been under pressure. We've all felt it in every area of our life. Jobs, careers, family, 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 <laughs> church, our callings. We've all been under pressure. Jill bought a pressure cooker. I don't understand it. It makes me nervous. It's dangerous. But it tastes pretty good. And that food under pressure, it cooks. It cooks fast. But there's a response to pressure that isn't good. See, after receiving that, just imagine I've got a tasty piece of sour, homemade sourdough bread here. Judas, after taking that broken bread, what does he do? He flees in the middle of the night. And he leaves the security and the presence of God Almighty. Judas takes off on his journey, his story, in the middle of the night. Because Judas, under pressure, is breaking bad. And the subtitle of my message today is called Breaking Bad. And I stole that from a TV show that you guys are too sanctified and too holy to watch. There was a television show, I believe it was on for five seasons. I'll just have to, to I'll be honest, I watched every episode. <laughs> and it was called Breaking Bad, and it was about Walter White, a mild-mannered, genius, high school chemistry teacher. Played by Brian Cranston. Read his autobiography, loved it. Love biographies. If you don't read biographies, you're missing out because you learn how Someone goes from here to here and everything that it took to get there. But it's about Walter White. And Walter White is just your regular, average Joe good guy. He's a, he's a chemistry teacher, had a long career. But he has betrayal in his life. He's been betrayed. Years ago, I, I think they were probably in college or thereafter, that, uh, he started a company. And he, he took, took a buyout in this company, forced out really something. It was all his design, all his idea, all his uh, invention. And he's basically forced out. Well, the other two people that forced him out, his closest friends, end up being multi-millionaires from this company and his idea. Well, Walter comes down with cancer, and it's alluded to in the show that the lung cancer that he is suffering from was caused from something that he was in when building that company. So Walter decides they're, they're, they're middle-aged. They, they, they have one son, has a disability. Well, they're surprised with a brand-new baby. And Walter, he breaks back. How am I going to, what am I going to do? How is my family going to be supported when I die with cancer? So Walter takes all his knowledge of chemistry and begins to cook crystal meth. As one often does. <laughs> so Walter builds an empire. A drug empire. And everything that he touches turns to garbage. 
He unleashes a tornado of destruction. He becomes a murderer. And I don't know how they did this, but as bad as Walter White is still in the back of your mind, you're rooting for this guy to win. And if you say you watched it and you didn't, you are a liar. I don't know how they did it. It must have been the actor. It must have been the writing. But this all goes back to narrative. It all goes back to story. We are called to be tellers, sharers of a narrative, of a story. Everything he touches turns to garbage. And it comes down to this. Money, 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 money. Because he wanted that security for his family. And ultimately, it's the story of how a good man breaks bad. Pain, pressure, unmet needs, broken dreams. All sources of breakage in our lives. And you can't avoid it. You're not going to avoid it because in this world... We have problems. We're going to be under pressure. And we're going to experience these things. And oftentimes it'll be worse than we can imagine. You will be under pressure. And you will suffer these things. But how you respond determines whether or not you break good or break bad. Walter White's backstory, it's just a tale as old as tales have been told. It's one of trust, it's one of betrayal. But when he breaks bad, when facing death, when facing an uncertainty, when being under pressure, not knowing what's going to happen, something that is completely out of control, he breaks bad. Walter's broken body does nothing but cause wounds and scars to those that are around him. Destruction to everyone he comes in contact with. The family that he was ultimately trying to save is torn apart. His wife leaves him. He's desperate. Spoiler alert, he dies in the end. Supposedly. You just never know anymore. Jesus Christ was betrayed. He was beaten. He was broken. He faced death, but he broke good. His broken body offers healing and salvation to the world, not harm. Walter's wounds harmed everybody around him. Everyone that he so desperately loved. So how does one break bad and another break good? I'm going to be honest with you. My tendency is to break bad. That's my tendency. And oftentimes when I'm under pressure, instead of doing what my mind tells me to do, or instead of doing what my heart tells me to do, I do what my mind tells me to do. Instead of clinging to the cross, instead of clinging to the promises of Jesus Christ, I want to take matters into my own hands and have that control and have it turn out how I think it should turn out. And then what happens is I become tempted with things and I begin to stray away from the things of Christ, the promises of Christ, the things that I've been taught, the things that I ponder in my heart that I know that are good. And then I know people that when under pressure, they break good. This is an obstacle. I'm going to overcome it. I'm going to finish the race through Christ who powers me. And the Holy Spirit's going to show my way. The Holy Spirit's going to make room where there is no room. Judas was frustrated. Have you ever been frustrated with God? Have you ever questioned God? I've been frustrated with God. I've questioned God. It's okay. I've wrestled, you know, wrestled, not wrestled, but wrestled with God. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I 
Judas was frustrated. He was disappointed with Jesus. Angry that he couldn't bend Jesus to his will. Let down that Jesus wasn't this preconceived notion of what their Messiah was supposed to be. So Judas breaks bad. So the question would be, what does Judas, a person, a real person, have in common with Walter White, a fictional person? What do they have in common? One thing. We could go in to deep theological debates. We could talk about certain instances and certain circumstances that brought both of them to where they were at, but it was about one thing. Control. And we talked about it last week. Trust. When we want to take matters into our own hands, essentially what we are saying is, God, I don't trust you enough to bring me out of this situation. God, I want to control it. And then we try to make it holy and saying, Lord, you just you guide me. You guide me, you show me, and I, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it. And God says, wait. God says, my ways are bigger than your ways. My mind's bigger than your mind. But we want to control it. So the one thing that they have in common is control. When, when they felt the pressure, when they experienced the pain, the disappointment, they wanted to make things turn out how they wanted them to turn out. Walter wanted to control his family's financial future, so he becomes a criminal. He takes on this alter ego, Eisenberg. And he's got a round criminal hat and black glasses and a goatee like Dave. And I'm just going to keep picking on Dave. And he takes on this, this, this criminal ego, this, this enterprise. I can do it. I can make it happen. I can control it. They don't know it. But they wrote a masterpiece that points to Jesus Christ. Because Walter White falling on his face and giving this all to Jesus Christ was his only way out. The only path to healing. The only path to keeping his family together. The only path to be secure in his finances. But he wanted that control. He had to have the control. Judas wanted to control Jesus. He wanted to manipulate him to violence, he wanted Jesus to just go light on the turn the other cheek, on the love your enemies. He wanted to manipulate Jesus. Ben and Judas did. He wanted to manipulate him to his, to his will. That's why he betrayed him with a kiss. Remember, we talked about it last week. Because he could have easily just said, There he is, right there, when the mob came. He could have said, Right there he is. All the disciples would have seen it. Jesus, everyone. All, all of the mob there, the Romans, the, 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 the hypocrites, the religious, they all would have seen it. But instead, what does he do? He just, he walks up and kisses him. He kisses him because, because he, he wanted to stay a disciple. Because I believe in Judas' mind, he thought, this is it. They think I'm on their side. I'm going to be on their side because I'm going to manipulate Jesus. I'm going to bend him. I'm going to make him go into violence. He won't have a choice. And then they'll think, he's still, you know, he's still one of my disciples. He, he, he could have ratted me out, but he, he just gave me a kiss. He, he called me, you know, rabbi. He wanted to continue being that disciple and take part in that violent revolution against the Roman Empire. Control, control, control according to his own agenda. When we break bad is when everything starts to spin out of control. Judas schemed to make 
Jesus into the kind of Messiah he thought he should be. And it just completely, utterly spun out of control. It was chaotic for Judas. And he ultimately committed suicide because of it. We're going to talk about that next week. We're going to talk about what it means to trust in the grace of Jesus Christ or the hypocrisy of bad religion. Because there's good religion. When we take communion, we are participating in good religion. When we worship, it is good religion. And that source of temptation to break bad, it's our desire to take control in our lives no matter the cost. Because when old Walter decided to do what he did and begin that criminal empire, he didn't think about the cost. But our cost, our decision to break good has already been paid for. It's already, there'll never be another temple that needs to be rebuilt. Because Jesus Christ fulfilled everything. Does he meet your need? Does he meet your need? Was it worth the cost? Does he bless us when we feel like we don't need, where we can't be blessed? He does. Does he reach down and heal our hearts and heal our bodies when we ask him, when we don't deserve it? He died a death that we should have died. Yes, Lord. And he does. Yes. Anytime we went out, Pastor Wells would always give, give you one word of advice when it comes to your message. <clears throat> and he would say this, preach Jesus. So we got to call Pastor many, many, many times. A lot of times we didn't have the money to go out when we traveled, when we played music, and he would just hand us a credit card. Not the church credit card, but his credit card. Get what you need, put gas in the van that he loaned us, and his advice would be preach Jesus. Preach Jesus and Jesus alone. Hope, love, repentance, We saw kids saved. We saw people delivered, kids delivered from addiction to to all types of things. Not just alcohol and drugs, but pornography and all these different struggles that they had. And we were on a mission to see that people broke good. When we manipulate Jesus, when we take control of the wheel, you know, the, the whole... cliche Jesus take the wheel. Jesus needs to take the whole car. So we drive like idiots. When we manipulate Jesus, when we take control, we unleash demonic influence in our lives and the lives of those, the lives of those that are around us. So how do we live? I'm glad you asked me, Joe. I'll tell you. I wanted to take the loudest swallow I could manage so it would be on mic. Give me a swallow and I'll pay you back one day, Uncle Don. So how do we live? How do we live if we can't take control, make things turn out how we think they should should be? We talked about the, the fight or flight instinct last week. That's just written in our DNA. So what's the alternative to the fight or flight? Trust. The answer is trust. Trust Jesus. You say, well, that's easy. You don't ever go through anything. You you pastor and you lead worship. You don't go through anything. Okay. Well, it can't be that simple. Well, maybe we make things too difficult. 
Maybe we write a game plan. Maybe we're looking at a playbook that's convoluted. When Christ just says, trust me, trust Jesus. Have you ever just trusted anything beyond your imagination? You, you trust? You, you cross bridges? I can remember being a little kid and we drove from Detroit to Canada. It was the biggest bridge I've ever seen in my life. It freaked me out. But I had to trust that I would get from the United States to Canada over this, I mean, I mean, just marvel, okay? Well, then they upped the game a little bit, smart Alex. When we drive back, we're going to go under the tunnel. Oh, uh. <laughs> we get just a few feet in the tunnel, and I see water. There's water coming through the walls of this tunnel that's under this water. And we're traveling like internationally. I was an international traveler <laughs> at like fourth grade. So the explanation was, if you don't see some water and see some leaks, you need to back out of the tunnel because the thing is going to collapse. So if you don't see some scars that have healed in your life, if you don't see where God's reached down after you trusting Him and bringing you out of hell fire, how will you ever grow? And better yet, how will you ever lead your neighbor to this thing called the trust of God? That's right. Trusted the tunnel. It had been there a long time, and it will be a long time after me. We can trust, or we can control. The mistrust of God didn't start with Judas. It started with Adam and Eve. And Adam had dominion, which just means he had sovereignty, control over the earth. And he held the keys, and he ruled by choice. And theologians talk about something called a dominion mandate. And that dominion mandate was the first commission to mankind. And that's like, like not a date where you go out with a man. Because when I was in college, I worked at a plant, and I still talk to one of the supervisors there at the plant. We share funny videos. We both love English comedy. And he would always look at me when I was one guy in my department. And he was like he was in charge of something else. And my boss would always talk about mandates, mandate this and mandate that. And my buddy was always would always say, "Why is he always talking about going on a mandate?" <laughs> but it was it was it was the dominion mandate. It was the very first commission. We're commission. Matthew 28, 19, you've, you've heard it. We're commissioned. But it was the first one commission of mankind. Adam and Eve, they were given this huge assignment to fulfill and have dominion over the entire earth. And their ability to fulfill this commission was dependent on their trust of God. When we trust God, we become commissioned. And paradise was lost because Adam handed the keys, handed his dominion to the enemy. Because something that we don't think about is Satan had no dominion or authority in the garden. He had not the authority to take dominion. Adam handed it to him. Because... Dominion empowers. That's why I mentioned to you, where you step is holy ground. Because we go in with a defeated mindset. In, 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 in situation after situation, we forget that Christ has already paid the cost. We forget that where we walk is holy ground. That the words we speak are holy words. Well, I got to do this. I got to clean this up. I have to stop talking this way. No, you need to trust God. 
You need to trust God. We need to shut our mouths sometimes. We need to trust God. We forget that we have dominion over those things that are against us. And those things are spiritual things. Those weapons are spiritual weapons, dominion and powers. In one act of disobedience, Adam gave his dominion away to the devil's plunder. But God's plan of redemption, it immediately kicked into action. God said, God said, he said, you can eat. You know, he, he said, listen, you can eat from every tree except this one. Don't eat of this tree. So Adam and Eve, they, they, they begin to feel cheated. They begin to feel the pressure of taking control instead of trusting God. And with one bite, things broke bad. Adam and Eve broke bad. Abraham did it. Took his situation into his own hands. He stopped trusting God. He had a child with his wife's handmaiden. If you go back and read the Old Testament, it's the entire story of Israel. They were provided for. They were protected from their enemies as long as they trusted God. Trust. Trust, trust, trust. But Israel trusted in security and economy. Does that that sound familiar? Does that sound a little bit familiar? Because if you look at the situation, security and economy were their idols. Sometimes I wonder like, you know, I hear Christians, they'll say, I have no influence. I have no dominion. Well, Nine out of your ten social media posts are about politics. It's 20 to 1. 20 about politics, one about Jesus. Let, Let me from experience tell you that the mother that has been left to raise a child by herself, that person that's struggling with homosexuality that you make fun of, those Kids that are living in broken homes that are being raised by their grandparents, they couldn't care less who you vote for, but they could care who you serve and who has brought you from the pit. We've all eaten from the tree of knowledge and We all think that we can understand and act in our situation by leaning to our own understanding. But that control has become idolatry. God's plan plan for Israel was to be the light of the world, teaching them the way of trust. A light that leads the world. A light that would have kept them from breaking bad. But they couldn't trust. And that's not to beat up on Israel because there are times when I don't trust. Two words that I would have for Israel should I have that garbage powered DeLorean and travel back. You're in the wilderness. God wants you to be the light of the world, and you will be. But I would say two words, until Jesus. Until Jesus. Same with you. When you begin to trust until Jesus. Jesus. Until Jesus. Jesus who never succumbed to the temptation to break Bad. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, which 
is just a reenactment of Israel in the wilderness. Where Israel failed, Jesus succeeded. Jesus looked at the enemy and he said, Trust. I trust God. You can give me the kingdoms of this world. You can make me that revolutionary that Judas and Peter and the disciples wanted me to be, that Israel wanted me to be, but I'm going to trust God. When it's difficult, I'm going to trust God. Jesus went from garden to garden, from the garden of Gethsemane to the garden of Joseph of Arimathea. And Gethsemane means press. Means that all oppressed is what it means. We talked about it last week. Remember, we talked about the scripture. He was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast away, he kneeled down praying, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. No, nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. Then what happened? An angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, encouraging him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was at great drops of blood falling down to the ground. We can be pressed. But I've never sweated blood. We can be pressed. I've asked God, why? Why is this happening to us? We serve you. We do this. We give. And God says, it's not about what you do. It's about what I have done. Trust. 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 Jesus under pressure kept his trust in God. Satan through Judas. Satan through Peter. Remember that? What did Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. They were, come on, Jesus. Let's break bad. We've been waiting on it. We're thirsty for blood. Come on. Let's break bad. And Jesus says, I trust God. I trust. How many of you have been in a situation where the only thing you can do is trust God? You might be in that situation right now. And I believe that God is moving just now. Just as we are speaking life. Just as we are believing just as we are seeing scripture after scripture after scripture that's been fulfilled. You are here. And God says, trust me and you will be here. Trust me some more and you will be here. And then go ahead and you might as well trust me when I take you that far and I'll move you here. Amen. Who, says, who says, I'm going to trust God? I'm going to trust God in my career? Who says it? I'm going to trust God for my family? My unsaved loved ones, those friends, those people that are in my workplace, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust God for the owners of my company. I'm going to trust God for the management at my job. I'm going to trust God for my community. I'm going to trust God for my school system. I'm going to trust God. Come on, don't just your hands down. Come on, I'll go back and hold them up if I have to. I'll just sit right next to you and make you as uncomfortable as you've ever been in your life just to help you hold those hands up and say, you know what? Who's, who's sick right now? Who's trusting God to be healed? Go ahead and speak healing over yourself. Power of life and death is in the tongue, people. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 5, it's by His stripes that we are healed. Just go ahead and speak it over yourself. I am healed through Jesus Christ and the stripes that He bore on His body for me. And I'm going to trust Him. Just go ahead and shout amen one time. See how it makes you feel. Amen. Shouting bunch. Irreverent. <laughs> Judas schemed it. He was a schemer. Peter, not so much. <laughs> He's like, I'm just going to pull out the sword and cut somebody's... I'm, gonna, I'm, cu- I'm trying to cut off his head. And now I'm going to be known all through history as a guy that cut off somebody's ear like I'm a skilled swordsman. He wasn't a skilled swordsman. He was belligerent. He was trying to cut that guy's head off. Come on. They're two different people, but they wanted the same goal. They wanted to bend Jesus to their preconception of what the Messiah was supposed to be like. How often do we do that in our lives? Well, God, you're supposed to do it this way. 
And God's like, who says, you? I mean, like he reminds me, like there are churches all over the world. Like you can go down any podunk taller in any state in the south and that church has it right and everybody else is wrong. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're waiting on me to say I got it all figured out, you'll never hear it. Because I believe that the Lord spoke and put it in my heart. You don't have it figured out. They don't have it figured out. And when we all get to heaven, we're going to realize none of us had it figured out. So my denomination is not better than your denomination. And listen, I don't have to argue about it on social media. There's nothing that anyone can say that will degrade or stop this movement called Jesus Christ. You can try it. They can try it all they want. But this thing is going to keep on marching on. And the more we get a hold of Scripture, the more we trust God, the more relevant that's going to be. The more that's going to happen. Peter, he he wasn't thought out. He didn't scheme. It was just impulse. And that's most of the time with us when we're in the situations that we are in. It's just impulse. We just go ahead and make that rash decision to cuss out the other driver. We just go ahead and make that rash decision to say, you know what, God, I feel the Spirit telling me to turn this way, but I'm going to go this way because I've been here before. I know better. Like he didn't create it. Like he doesn't know the... The, the neural pathways in, in our minds that are being rewired by the things that we're feeding ourselves. And he just says, Susan, trust. Just trust. Simple. Guys, go ahead and come up. It's great to see Hunter. <clears throat> Hunter, and, and who's a youth pastor, and Logan, who's, who's our youth pastor. That two, two guys that went all through mine and Jill's youth group here at Kingsway Church that love God, serve God, and taking something that was planted here and taking it and sharing it with the next generation. From garden to garden, garden to garden, Jesus trusted God. He yielded control. From his arrest to his condemnation, Jesus relented. He said, God, nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. Even you, you ever read the account of Jesus when he's on trial? In a, a long time I didn't understand because my mind thinks if you're going to argue with me, I'm going to win. I'm right, you're wrong, period. My mind, relying on my own thinking, says you're the Messiah. You can win this argument. Open your mouth. But... During his trials, he refused to answer, listen, 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 even in defense of himself. Even in defense of the movement. Even in the defense of his calling, what he was sent here for. He doesn't even defend himself against Pilate. So what does he do? He bears witness to the truth. Are we bearing witness to the truth? The truth of the cross says even though Jesus had just cause to fight, He refused. And it's because of that that people didn't believe Him. Some in the movement didn't believe him. The zealots didn't believe him. The high priests didn't believe him. The Romans didn't believe him. Because he trusted. 
Because he didn't take control. That's what we want our leaders to do. We want them to take control. Take control because we're right and everybody else is wrong. We need to lord over this bunch because that's the only way we'll reach him for Jesus Christ. If you preach my funeral, you say he trusted God and he bore witness to the truth. I have no false pretense. I am what I am. Because I'm trusting. I'm bearing witness to the truth. I don't get it right every time. Thankfully, I have people in my jail that really, really minister to me and tell me, hey, here's the path. You are, you're not even on the mountain. You're, you're kind of in the lake. And now the path's muddy and you're a dummy. And we need that. You need somebody like that in your life. Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. The thief on the cross mocked him. And he was mocking him. You remember that? He, he, he says, he trusted God. will let God deliver him now. But, oh, but little did he know. See, we often think that Jesus died this, you know, he's on the cross and somehow he's just this hero that they're just looking at Jesus dying on the cross. Someone that is defeated, hanging on the cross, and somehow he's just this her beautiful, heroic figure. But to the religious, Jesus didn't die as a heroic Messiah. He died as a failed revolutionary. See, Friday to Saturday is the proof that taking control leads to death and failure. But on Sunday, we see that trust wins way down to the very depths of death. You might be in a situation, but you're not dead. You may be in a situation, but you've got one breath right after the other. You're in a situation right now, but you can take one step. You can put one foot in front of the other. You're in a situation, but you're not dead yet. You have the hope of Jesus Christ. You have the trust of Jesus Christ. Don't get too excited, church. I mean, you know, I'm just speaking life over you. Don't get too excited now. You know, we don't want anybody on the hill to call the police because there's something rowdy happening down here at Kingsway Church. There's some people that have been delivered from addiction, delivered from sickness. It's okay sometimes to say, you know what, I have victory. We sing about it. I'm going to see a victory. Victory. I got, can I just be honest? I I don't mean this. I'm not, I love, I love the church. I love leading worship. I got so offended at our youth. They wouldn't let me lead tonight. Because apparently, I'm an old guy. (laughs) They're like, we want you to play drums. And they were just saying that because they didn't want to hurt my feelings. I'm like, I'm not playing drums. I'm a 4-4 time signature. I'm not like Chris. I can't pick up on this stuff. Okay, just give me a hi-hat and a snare and a bass drum. I can play all day long. They don't do that anymore. And I got irritated. I'm like, I would really love to lead worship because these kids, they've got a hold of something. You're going to see some dancing tonight. You're going to see some shouting tonight. You're going to see some jumping up and down. I wanted to be a part of that. I'm too old. They didn't want me. It's okay to shout sometimes. We're all, nobody's going to make fun of you in here. Nobody's recording you. 
I mean, the Facebook thing's on me. I'm the one that's going to get the complaints. People are going to go to pastor. Jason said this and he said that. It's like Facebook people, you know? I'm just kidding. It's okay to let your neighbor know, I trust God. You think when they see you walking, how old are you? Can I tell that? 76, 78? You, you think they see Pastor Wells walking around the neighborhood? You think that's like, they think, oh, well, that's just a, he's just been eating right and he's just exercised an entire life. And he's trusted in God. And he's putting one foot in front of the other. And whatever the enemy throws at him, he says, you know what? I trust God. We need that because it's with our testimony that we overcome. Jimmy, you, you've got a testimony. Sandy, you've got a testimony. Uncle Don, you should be dead. You shouldn't be here. But you have a testimony that says, I trusted God. He brought me out. I have life ahead of me. I have ministry and calling ahead of me. Jared, you should be destitute right now. And God says, I'm going to bless you with a career, a renewed career. I'm going to give you opportunity. If you want to go this other direction, I'm going to give you that, and that will probably pay you more money. And you should be destitute right now. Had it not been for the hand of God and the Holy Spirit working in your life and in your marriage, and God said, I see that he's a great worker. I see that he's been faithful. I see that he's coming. I see what he's doing, and I am going to bless him immensely. Amen. And Curtis, where do I begin? When I think about Curtis, I think, this guy right here, I relate to this guy. He's our comic relief. Like, I can say things and he's not offended. Everybody gets offended over everything. Curtis isn't offended at the stuff I say. I wouldn't say in front of 99% of you people. Because I love you too much. I love Curtis, but he doesn't care. He just laughs. And what has God done for you? The, the enemy says, you know what? Death and death's going to come. Come, Sickness is going to come. But you're going to overcome it. You're going to raise a generation of girls that are going to go out and be Proverbs 31 women. And God's blessed you financially. He's blessed your home. He's blessed you with health. And God says, I have a plan. And you're going out because of one thing, trust. It's, it's by our testimonies. We all have it. We need to have a testimony service. I think about Matt. And the enemy said, I'm going to destroy you. Where, what are your kids doing right now? Where were they this morning? Right here. And the enemy said, I'm going to destroy you, Matt Gullet. I'm going to destroy you with addiction. I'm going to destroy your marriage and in turn destroy your children. They'll never, ever serve me because they're going to look at this. They're going to suffer from this. And God says, what? God says, I am making you, not made, but making you whole. I'm healing you. I'm bringing you out. Your children and your children's children are going to be blessed because of the decisions that you make in trusting God. Amen. Amen. Doug, I don't know why things have happened the way that they have happened. I know that it's the enemy that comes to kill, steal, and destroy, and that it's Jesus Christ that gives life. I can't explain why you and Jamie have went through what you've went through, but I know one thing. You've trusted God. I know one thing, that He has a reward for you. I know one thing, that you are going to be reunited in heaven with those children. I know that when you walk into heaven, there are going to be a herd of Middletons that are going to say, What took you so long? Amen. 
And you can say, I'm trusting God and I've trusted God. And here we are reunited in heaven. We didn't get to have it on earth. But what the enemy took away, what the enemy destroyed, God is going to make right. He is fulfilling things. You will have wholeness. You will have completeness in the name of Jesus. And I think about the child that Jill and I lost and what it did to our relationship, what it did to our home, what it tried to do to our relationship, what it tried to do in our home. And the enemy said, I'm going to get you. This is it. The ministry is over. You are done. I've already taken it and stolen it. And Jesus Christ says, I'm going to heal you and I'm going to make you whole in the name of Jesus. And that's exactly what he did because we trusted God. blessed I had to put my glasses on to make sure that it was Doug (laughs) I'm close to 50 I had LASIK and it's starting to go away so if there's just a little bit of light that'll be a spiritual lesson for you He's a God of resurrection. Turn over to 1 Peter 2, 21 through 25. Get this. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in in his mouth who when he was reviled did not revile in return remember he didn't call down those legions of angels he just submitted to God and said he trusted he suffered he did not threaten but committed himself to him who judges righteously who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. God's not done with you. God has life for you. God has planned for you. God's healing is there for you. God's salvation is there for you. And he says, trust. He says, cling to it. God's faithful. God is faithful, and when we trust Him, our wounds become healing for others. When we break bad, we inflict the wounds on others, but when we break good, our wounds become a healing. You have an option, options to either trust or control. Control has demonic influence, but the way of trust is radical and different from everything in this world that we've been taught and everything that the world tells us that we have to cling on to for that security, for that economy, for this, for that, for that to happen. And God says that is the way of the world. Trust me, cling to me. I can say it. I can boldly say it because I've been there, I've done it, and I do it. And I've gotten at times where I wanted to control And Jill says, you're not praying. You're not reading your word. And essentially, if she knew this terminology, she would say, you are breaking bad. So I have to get back up here. And I have to trust in him. And I have to walk in his grace and in his presence. Do you need healing this morning? Does someone need healing? Raise your hand. Anybody need, you need healing this morning? Healing this morning? Can I pray for you? 